who has fully accepted and internalized what they were taught, and as a result, they were firm in God and in who God said they were. However, one day, their country was invaded by a foreign nation, and they were taken captive and brought away to a foreign land. The people were different. The language was different. The diet was different. The worship style was different. The belief system was different. Everything in this country was different. But while there, and while being bombarded with all these different things, these boys still did not adopt to the evil practices of their captors. They still held strong to what they were taught and what they learned while they were in their own land. They still held true to their identity. And by this time, you'd have figured out that I'm speaking of none other than Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And I find this story quite compelling because usually the longer you're exposed to a different environment or a different country, the easier it is for you to be assimilated into this new country. Just look at what happens to many of us when we go to, to the United States. We see some persons after some time there and they, they speak out differently and their interests are different and there are some things that are different. However, it is different with Daniel and his friends. It's interesting that as time went on, they maintain their belief and they maintain their identity. And we see that later in Daniel's life, that he chose death, to face death, rather than to go, to go different from what the Lord God had commanded him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all because these young men knew who they were and they were firm in their identities as children of the living God. The title of my sermon this morning is Identity Crisis. Whose image are you in? Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for another blessed Sabbath day. We thank you for all that you've done for us. As I'm about to speak the word this morning, I pray that these words will be given power and that hearts will be touched as a result of your message. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me in your, with me in your Bibles to Genesis 1, verse 27. And it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So God created us in his image. The first thing that we have to do is to define what is meant by the word image. Well, one definition that I found is that an image is a physical likeness or representation of a person, an animal, or a thing. So typically, when we think of image, we think of something external. We think of something physical. That's the first thing that we think about when we think about an image. For those of us who have children, persons might say that your child is the spitting image of you. But is this the only definition of image. Let's look at what Colossians 3 verses 9 to 10 has to say. It says, Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. I'll say that the last part again, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So here we see that an image is not just a physical thing. An image can be the, like your, your knowledge, thinking. It can be your character, if you will. But let's start that up with what Ellen White says in Patriots and Prophets, page 65. He says this, Man was fear 
God's image, both in outward resemblance and in character. And we know that God's law is the transcript of his character. It continues, Christ is the express image of the Father, but man was formed in the likeness of God. His nature was in harmony with the will of God. His mind was capable of comprehending divine things. His affections were pure. His appetites and passions were under the control of reason. He was holy and happy in bearing the image of God in perfect obedience to his will. But, of course, unfortunately, we know what happened. Going back to the beginning with our foreparents, Adam and Eve, they allowed the devil to trick them into misrepresenting the character of the Almighty God. Eve was not satisfied with her created position and she desired something more. And the devil knew this, and this is what he used to trick her. So in their conversation, they asked, Satan told her in relation to the truth, he said, You shall not surely die, for God must know that in the day that thou eateth thereof, that your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods. And that's what she desired. And that is exactly what the devil desired as well. He was not satisfied with what God created him to be and what God told him that he should be. He wanted something more. He wanted to be as God. And this is where this whole identity crisis started. And coming on down through the ages, mankind has had problems just because they have not accepted what God says they are or the identity that God has created for them. Brothers and sisters, the devil has set it up that everyone wants to find who you are. Whether, whether it is by your race, by your gender, by your nationality, some person wants to you be defined by, by your profession, or your political affiliation, or whatever ideology that you might subscribe to. All of these things, persons see to define us by. So it is quite difficult, and especially in today's world, these influences have direct access to us. We have access to music, through the movies, social media, news program, all of these things brought to us through our television sets, through the computer, and even through our very phones. Satan through the work of men, has sought to confuse us about who we are so that we will never become who God said we are to be. But the Bible says in Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by God. And this is what we need to do. Patriots and Prophets, page 52 says, the law of God is sacred, as, you know, sacred as God himself. It is the revelation of his will, a transcript of his character, the expression of divine love and wisdom. The harmony of creation depends on the perfect conformity of all beings, of everything, animate and inanimate, to the law of the Creator. So it says here, the harmony of all creation depends on us conforming with what God says we are to do. And this is why we have so many different challenges in the world today because everyone wants to go their own way. Everybody wants to do their own thing. And they call this freedom not knowing that they're only shocking themselves in sin by this kind of thing. The code goes on to say that God has ordained laws for the government, not only for living beings, 
But for all operations of nature, everything is under fixed laws which cannot be disregarded. But while everything in nature is governed by natural laws, man alone of all the inhabitants of the earth is amenable to moral laws. Now, a few months ago, our Prime Minister called on the church to reach the hearts of men. He said, and I quote, the government has made significant investment in crime fighting hardware and software, but now has turned its attention in investing in hardware. And listen to the rest. He said, we have a massive army of heart surgeons right here in the church. You have the medicine, which is the Bible and the gospel. I need you to reach beyond the walls of your church and reach those men, especially those young boys who believe that the only solution is violence. And we know that some years ago, our then Minister of National Security, Peter Bunting, also said something similar. He said that it would take divine intervention to cure Jamaica's crime problem. So here we have it. Our nation's leaders are saying this. They're saying that after all the time, after all the resources, after all their technology and their experts and their programs and everything that they tried has failed, and now they're saying that the only solution to this thing is a heart change, and the only one that can change the heart is God. And not only in Jamaica, brethren, when we look overseas, we see what is happening between Israel and Palestine. We see the bombs flying, we see the persons dying, we see suffering. When we look to the United States, even last year, it was in, in a state of total disarray. There was burnings and lootings and, I mean, persons were just set against each other. And I think that it continues on to today. Because persons have identified themselves as things other than what God said. So one person says I'm a Democrat and this is what we believe. One person says I'm a Republican, this is what I believe. One person says I'm black, this is where I should go. Other says I'm white and this is what, that's where we should go. And we can go on and on into all the different groups that men and women have placed themselves in. And all this is because people have rejected the eternal God. They have fallen prey to their environment and have gravitated towards the things that are around them. But the question that we all need to answer this morning is, do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Do you know why you are here? And do you know uh, who created you? Children, <laughs> Everyone, adults and children, you are children of the Most High God. First Peter 2 verse 9 says, Be but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this is what God is saying that we are here. We are a chosen generation. We are a peculiar people. We are different from those of the world. And we should embrace that, and we should be proud of that, and we should go out there and tell persons about that. But of all these issues that human, human race is facing, though terrible they may be, the most troubling thing is when a child of God doesn't know who they are. This is troubling because the other categories of persons, they have not met God. They have not been exposed to the truth. But we have. Many of us have been raised in the church. We've come up from grade school, kindergarten, primary, early teen, youth, up to adult summer school, been involved in part timers and all different things. And yet, there are some who still don't know. They are. It's ultimately a problem of what we have allowed from the environment to see in. 
It is said that by beholding, we become changed. So, what are we watching? What are we listening to? What are we reading on a daily basis? What are we feeding on? Is it the Word of God? Or if it's, is it the movies, is it the music, the sports, social media, politics, the influence of unconverted friends? What is it? What is it that we have allowed to take the place that belongs to God? And, brethren, this acceptance of worldly things has eternal consequences. Listen to this quote. And it says, As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified to obedience to truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. Wow. So this is saying that by uniting with the world and partaking of the same spirit of the world, that people who should be God's people are seeing things in the same light as the person in the world. And continues to say this, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy and popular side. When we go back to Daniel and his three friends, they didn't choose it, they never chose the easy and popular side. The first test was of diet, and they chose the, the, the Lord's food instead of the king's food. The other test they faced was in terms of breaking the second commandment, and they refused to go, though they faced the fiery furnace. Daniel himself also faced another test of praying to someone else other than the Almighty God, or face the lion's den. But Daniel chose to pray to God nonetheless, and he opened up his window for all to see that he was praying to the Almighty God. These persons did not conform to what the world said. They held true to who they were, and we need to do the same. Brethren, today we have people embracing worldly ideologies, thinking that these things supersede what God says we are. My brothers and sisters, our identity is not determined by anything that humans or Satan has constructed. It is determined by the living God, our Creator, who made us to mirror His image or His character. We have to remember that we are just passing through this world. Yes? So we have to get our character and our identity right through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can fit in to the world to come. We are not supposed to fit in down here. James 4 verse 4 says, the adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Satan is the God of this world. So how could I want to fit into anything that is happening down here? But the question is, how do we escape this identity crisis? And how do we become firm in the knowledge of who we truly are? Well, first thing that we must do, we must surrender all to Jesus. Second Corinthians 5 verse 15 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away in whole, all things are become new. We must surrender to God. We must confess our sins and ask Jesus to come into our lives and take control. And then we will build from there. And I'll back it up with the Zion of Ages, page 37, which says this. Satan was exalted, exalting that he had succeeded, succeeded in debasing the image of God in humanity. Then Jesus came to restore in man 
the image of his maker. None but Christ can fashion a new character that has been ruined by sin. He came to expel the demons that control the will. Can you imagine that? To expel the demons that control your will. How many of you have demons up there that are controlling you? You need to ask Jesus to come into your hearts to expel those demons and allow you to walk in the way that God says that you should walk. He continues, he says that he came to lift us up from dust to reshape the mad character of the pattern of the divine character and to make it beautiful with his own glory. But while Jesus came to restore us through his blood, he also came to live his life as an example unto us. Jesus came to this world as a man with no power that is not available to us all right now, yet he was able to overcome sin. Many persons think that Jesus came to this world in a different way and that he was somehow unfair because he had special things that, that were not available to us, but no, he came to here, he came to earth as a man. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 7 says, let this man be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Hebrews 2 verse 16 to 17 says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. So Jesus came here as a man. And Hebrews 4 verse 15 says this, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but in all points was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And this is what we need, brethren. We need God's mercy. We need his grace and we need his help if we are to overcome while we're here on earth. So, what can we learn from Jesus as an example? Well, the first thing we can learn is that Jesus had a very strong prayer life. Before every major event, Jesus found somewhere and he went and he prayed. So this is the Son of God and he still had to make time to be deep in prayer so that he could keep that connection with the Father while he was here on earth. So if Jesus did that, then what about us? Should we use it as an example of how we should live our lives too? And if we examine Jesus' prayer life a bit more closely, we will see that he started his day right. He prayed early in the morning while he was still dark. Mark 1 verse 35 says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. No, he got up early, found a solitary place, and he prayed. Brethren, there is nothing as sweet as that first early morning prayer or devotion that you have in God. School is quiet, you have Literally, no distractions, and it's just you and the Lord, and you're allowed to just commune with Him. And we need to use that example. So, Jesus started out like that. And of course, I'm sure that, like Daniel, Jesus also prayed three times a day or even more so He could continue with that commune and that contact with His heavenly Father. Now, next, we look at the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4 verse 1 says, Jesus, 
full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And Luke 4 verse 18 says, and these are Jesus' words, when he was reading the, the, the scripture, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted, to preach the deliverance of, to the captive, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So we need the Holy Spirit. And what can the Holy Spirit do for us? Well, we can get the fruits of the Spirit. We get the gifts of the Spirit. But not only that, the Spirit is there to guide us into all truth, to show us things to come, to teach us what to say, and to give us power to witness. So we need God's Spirit. The next thing, Jesus knew the Scripture. In the Bible, where we see that Jesus was tempted of God, what did Jesus use to defeat the enemy? He used the word. He kept saying, it is written. So the devil came with the first temptation, and he said, if thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man shall be written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then he came again, and the devil got tricky. He used scripture as well, and said, brought him up to the top of the temple, to the pinnacle, and said, throw yourself down, because it is written. He was giving his angels, you know, charge over thee, and they will bear thee up in their hands, and your feet will not touch the ground. And but Jesus knew the scripture as well, and he said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And before I can go further, Satan kept asking him, if thou be the Son of God. Is it that he thought that Jesus was in some identity crisis as a, and didn't know who he was? He kept asking, if thou be the Son of God. And typically, when persons aren't sure of who they are, that's when they try their utmost to defend themselves and, and prove themselves. But we you know this Jesus here, Jesus didn't even bother to uh, for the person that was about if he's the Son of God. He kept on hitting him with the word in terms of the specifically regarding the temptation that he was bringing towards him. Jesus was certain of who he was. And the last temptation, Satan came to him and he brought him up to this high mountain and he showed him the kingdoms of the world and he said, all these things I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him alone shall thou serve. And this is where Satan was going on along. Because this is what he wants. Worship. This is what he wanted from Jesus. This is what he wants from all of us. Worship. And he will come in some other directions just as he did with Jesus, but eventually he'll come to the point that he wants worship. So he might come to you in an innocent way and you might fall for that and you get sucked in and you go, you know, gradually go, go, go until you end up worshiping him, but this is what he ultimately wants. But Jesus was able to fight back against his temptation through his knowledge of the world. And we need that as well. No. But not only that, while we're on the topic of the world, we need in these times, what we need is also present truth. Now, any might in the book where the writing speaks before says this I have seen the danger of messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock, to sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible edge advantage to injure the cause. But for subjects as the sanctuary, in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus 
are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show us our present position. Sorry, where our present position is establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. I know all these topics are sermons unto themselves, so I won't get into them, but I list them there so that you can you can look them up and do your research and, and the reading by yourselves. Now let's move on. What does Jesus do that we can use as our example? Jesus went to church. Luke 4 verse 16 says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Not on Sunday. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up for it to read. Now, there are many persons today who say that, listen, I, I, I'd rather stay and worship at home by myself because there's too many hypocrites at church and all of these things. But this is not the example that Jesus said. Jesus had 12 disciples and among them was Judas, the, the betrayer. Peter even betrayed him. Thomas was, was, was a doubting person. But Jesus still had that 12 that he associated with. So we need the fellowship of the brethren. So don't let anybody feel that you can just sit by yourself and, and every week you worship. You have to find a church family and you come together and you worship. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says this, As iron sharpened iron, so a man sharpened the countenance of his friends. So we need good Christian friends around us. Oh, Jesus was God, but when he came, he had the 12 disciples. And when he was going through his trial at Gethsemane, he brought three of his disciples with him. In Matthew 26, verses 37 and 38, he says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here with me and watch. Giving us an example again that we need each other. The final example that I'll give you for, in terms of what Jesus did, is that Jesus was active and he went out there and he proclaimed the gospel to others. He did not come here and keep what he knew to himself. He and his disciples went from place to place and they shared the gospel with others. And aside from the obvious benefits, which is the first thing, which is to bring others to Jesus, there's another benefit of sharing, and is that the more you share, the more you learn yourself. And I'm a personal testimony of this, because I grew up in the church, and even coming up to, especially in, when I became an adult, and started to go to, to, to the adult Sabbath school, I didn't follow much what was happening in class, and I could not share much, because some of the lesson was, was always missing. But one day, my Sabbath school teacher asked me to teach, to teach the class. And I'm like, good. And then, so I taught the class, and I had to dig so deep into the Word that the Holy Spirit just started to work, and I got an understanding that I never had before. And I was able to teach. And I found that the, the more I studied and the deeper I got, the better my understanding was of the Word of God. And that's because I, I had to study, you know, I share it. So sharing is important. It says not only to bring to the Christ as the ultimate thing, but also for your own personal development. So brethren, we need these things. We need to accept Jesus into our lives, have a strong prayer life, have the Holy Spirit, know the scripture, and um, find a good Good church to be, be a part of, of course, the Sunday Adventist church to be a part of, and to share the gospel with others. Now, especially in these last days, we need to be firm in our identity. 
Today we are living in a digital age and the devil knows that. If he can control this new town square which is in cyberspace, then he can control you. The only defense is to be firm in who you are as a child of God and guard the avenues of your heart. There's a quote that I saw some time ago and it says this, the greatest weapon is not the gun or the bomb, it is the control of information. To control the world's information is to manipulate all the minds that consume it. And of course, the devil is doing his best to control information today. So we have to be mindful of what we open up ourselves to because it just might become changed as a result of this. Now, as I close, let's look at the story of Lot. And we, this is a very popular story. We know Lot is Abraham's nephew. And there came a time when the land could not contain them both. They, their, their possessions were so great. And there was strife between the first men of Lot and of Abraham. And Abraham, being a good man that he was, said to Lot, showed them the land and said, Listen, this is the land. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And we know the story. Lot chose the plains of Jordan and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And then a couple chapters down, when we read, we find that Lot was actually now living inside Sodom. And this is a lesson to us. And for our friend over there, um, Ellen White says that when Lot actually entered Sodom, he went there with good intentions, for example, he thought that he could actually resist what was going on there and protect his family from it, not knowing that he would not be able to do that. And many of us today do that. We flirt with sin. We try to push the envelope, so to speak. You know, go as close to sin as we can without going over. Sometimes even, I mean, even for some person for religious reasons, thinking that you have to go up a certain direction and kind of, you know, toe the line. But no, we shouldn't do that because eventually you will get something and what happened to God and his family can happen to you. So here is God. He's there in Sodom. And the Lord declared that Sodom was to be destroyed. And, these angels, and the angels came for the destruction. Now, <clears throat> now, Lot, now they came to Lot and they told him, and I don't pass on, they told him that they are going to destroy the city and, they need, and, and he needs to leave. So of course, he would have gone to his son in laws and his daughters and told them, told them this, and, and they rejected and he came back. But the interesting thing that I saw is that the Bible says that Lot lingered. While they were talking to him, he lingered. And I'm thinking, what a state to be. To know that destruction is coming. To know that the messengers who gave him this message were not normal beings. Because he saw when they acted with the poor God to cast blindness on their hearts. And to know the truth. Because he was raised with, um, with, he was exposed to Abraham, but yet being in a state that you live, as well as his family as well. And then it says that the, that, that, that the angels had to take them all by hand, not his wife and his two daughters by hand, and get them out of the city. And we know the story well. That's why, because her heart was really in Sodom. Her heart was not after the things of God, but was after the things of Sodom. I guess they had a beautiful home and Sodom, and Sodom was this wonderful place. And though the instruction was not to look back, she chose to look back at the sin and the situation that she was leaving instead of looking forward to what God actually had in store for her. And we need to learn from the story already. We can't keep focusing 
back on sin. And especially if you have passed sin or if, if you have a certain past, leave that alone. Right? You have come to Jesus now and you have shown him the way. Look forward to where God is setting you and who God says you are. So we have to be careful, brethren. Right? We have to be quite careful. And listen, we are living in a time just like Psalm to be, where spiritual wickedness is all around and can clearly, it can be clearly seen. So I hope that we don't have persons here today who are in that same state of lingering, hmm? lingering in sin, lingering in uncertainty. Move forward, find out what God says, who God says you are, and then move right into that. He will send His Holy Spirit to help you. So, as I close, we have no more time to linger, brethren. We must be strong. We must be restored to the image of God as we get closer to the end. Because we need that strength, not only to stand, but to proclaim the everlasting gospel to the entire world. My last quote is from Christ of the Blessings, page 69. And it says this Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come claim them as his own. Brethren, I want to be in that number and I hope that you